Okay, uh, welcome everyone as people are entering the Zoom room. Um, it's a privilege to welcome you on this beautiful afternoon. Uh, my name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design. A privilege to welcome you to the third event in A Plus D Thursdays, a weekly public program that we'll be exploring throughout the semester themes around time-based art. Uh, if you've uh, checked in before, whether last semester or over the last couple of years, many of you know that this series, the Thursday series, is embedded inside of a broader course, Letters and Sciences 25, or um, thinking through the arts and design at Berkeley. It's a course that we created in order to expose students of all majors, of all, um, uh, all different um, positions on campus, um, to a range of art forms, literature, film, visual art, um, social practice, um, design, and more. And to do so with the central theme, this semester's theme is time-based media art. And one of the exciting things about it is that we also have an embedded public lecture series open to the community. So welcome to enrolled students and welcome to non-enrolled students who are tuning in with us today. Before I proceed further in continuing with the welcome, I do want to acknowledge the land on which our campus stands uh, and hence the land on which this gathering takes place, essentially, even if we do so virtually today. UC Berkeley is sited on the unceded and ancestral land of the Ohlone people. And as we convene on this campus, online and offline, we recognize not only the Ohlone history, um, but also that the Ohlone people are active flourishing members of the Berkeley community and the Bay Area region more broadly. In fact, this course and the lecture series has often been thinking about what it, the politics and, and aesthetics of gathering, of the politics and aesthetics of taking up place. And we're doing so and continuing to do so this semester as we think about time-based media art. If you've looked at some of the announcements about the series, you know that this is a particularly resonant theme for our campus, for our region, and for the world. Students and community are going to be thinking about forms that address social and political issues through a range of mixed media forms, forms that make use of photography, video, and the screen. Our exploration this entire semester, and hence the even um, your ability to tune in, is made possible by a generous donation from the Kramlick Art Foundation, um, who've supported every aspect of this course and its lecture series. So all of us are indebted to them uh, and also um, offer continued gratitude for their commitment to research and educational programming in the field of time-based media art. And in thinking, I have to say, about how to mobilize a discussion about the use of the photograph or the use of the screen as a vehicle for addressing and redressing social and political inequities, I knew I absolutely wanted to be sure to include the Bay Area, the Bay Area's own Chris Johnson in this series. Chris Johnson, an artist, organizer, curator, teacher, writer, and civic leader who has inspired so many in our region um, and nationally and beyond. Johnson is a photographer and a video artist and is currently chair and professor of photography at the California College of the Arts. Johnson's work is in the collections of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Smithsonian Institution, the Oakland Museum of California, the Center for Creative Photography, the Polaroid International Collection and more. He's the author of The Practical Zone System for Film and Digital Photography, now in its sixth edition. And he's been president of SF Camera Work, in the past also director of the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography, chair of the City of Oakland's Cultural Affairs Commission, and he's also been the Media Wall Project Manager and Public Art Management Team member for the Oakland Museum and the Port of Oakland. In 1994, amongst his other past projects, he co-produced and directed The Roof is on Fire with Suzanne Lacey, uh, a project that was broadcast on Cron TV. Johnson has also more recently received grants from, for instance, the Rockefeller Foundation for his collaborative work with Hank Willis Thomas titled Question Bridge, Black Males, an innovative transmedia project that represents and redefines Black male identity in America, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that today. 
here to speak about a range of practices, mixed media practices that deeply address and redress the political inequities and mixed economies of our social landscape. Please help me welcome, even if you're muted, Chris Johnson to the screen. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> and I, I wanna begin by thanking UC Berkeley for inviting me to come and talk about my work. I mean, it's really an honor and I'm really looking forward to but I'm sure it'll be an interesting conversation. And for those of you who are familiar with the um, Question Bridge Black Males Project, you'll know that talking about its origins and conceptual framework are definitely appropriate for the theme, race, community engagement, and time-based art. But I, I'd also would like to suggest a slightly broader frame of reference for understanding my work. Um, you know, the events surrounding the fall of Donald Trump and the rise of Stacey Abrams <laughs> in turning Georgia blue um, have almost made us forget um, the dramatic mass marches all over the world in protest of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, those movements um, made it really clear that there's an inexorable um, connection between race and injustice. Those things are woven together. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of you are aware of the in fact, the, the very dubious notions of, about race were adopted in the 17th century to support chattel slavery in our country. So you can't really disentangle race from injustice. Um, and, but this is, you know, as a black artist, um, these are not abstract or historic issues for me. Um, they're parts of my lived experience. Um, but a, on a personal level, I've actually been extraordinarily lucky as you'll see. I've been more witness to rather than a direct victim of racial violence and injustice. Um, but still, um, those issues are inexorably woven together. And so what I'd like to do, I think as a frame of reference for understanding my work would be to ask the question, how can the creative process serve the interests of redressing and healing injustice when you experience it? Um, is that possible? I mean, how does art function as a healing tool, um, both on the personal level and on the societal level. And I think that frame of reference would make um, the work that I've done leading up to Question Bridge and, uh, and, and around it um, make more sense. So I have a number of individual projects to share with you, but the central one definitely is Question Bridge Black Males. Um, so in case some of you are not familiar with that, um, what I wanna do to get everyone on the same page is share uh, a short two minute trailer, just so you get to see what the uh, formal and uh, basic details of it are. So here's Question Bridge trailer. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Black men, do you want to get out of the situation that you're in? What is the reluctance to taking responsibility for improving our community? Are your children better or worse off as a result of your involvement? Why wouldn't you be happy with this on the one day? Why are you so violent? Why do you have that take mentality? Why are you afraid of being intelligent? Why? 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 What I want to know is why? I believe that we incorporated a lot of things that are unhealthy to us. We are supposed to be tough. I can't let them see no type of sucker. Along with various other stereotypes. The level of mentorship in our community is not as strong as it possibly could be. When I came up, crack was a quick way for a black man to make a million dollars. Sometimes I think because we think we're black, we, we're some other kind of human beings, but we're just like most other human beings. Why? didn't y'all leave us the blueprint. We did leave you a blueprint. We just didn't tell you where it was. That's something that we dropped the ball on. What do you fear? That something will harm my children. I fear success. 
Am I the only one where it's probably eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people? <laughs> that word, you have to stop using it. I think black people can say nigga anytime they want. How dare you? What what right do you have to use this word? A lot of niggas questions for the rap. What is common to all of us that we can say makes us who we are? Hmm. This is the easiest question in the world to answer. The thing that we have in common is that we are male and we are black. All right, my question is, I try to live good, but I'm surrounded by bad. And I want to know what it is I could do to do better and live peaceful, surrounded by all evil. How can, how can I do that? So, so that's an introduction to um, the project. And you can get a sense, of course, that it's clearly about Black men speaking for themselves. And I'll talk more about how it uh, evolved. But a little bit of background about the um, injustice that I said that I was a witness to. And um, I used this photograph by the great documentary photographer, Roy de Carava, um, to illustrate the way that Brooklyn, New York looked to me when I grew up in the 50s and 60s. Um, there was a time before the passage of the civil rights, um, fair housing movements when um, you can see, you know, it was obviously a working class neighborhood where a mother could walk her children. Um, this is the way the black community felt to me when I grew up, growing up. But with the passage of the fair housing laws, um, African-Americans who could leave I've decided to leave. And so I witnessed the, the sort of rupture of the Black American neighborhood communities into this photograph by Bruce Davidson is the way we think about inner cities now and this is the way we experience it. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind, seeing the um, movement of African Americans who could out of the hood, um, leaving a concentration of sort of poverty and violence um, was something that um, really was a shocking experience for me and something that I remembered um, later on. And you'll, you'll see the relevance of it in a minute. But telling a little bit about me, um, I, mean, I um, got interested in politics and folk music and uh, ended up moving to the Haight Ashbury and had um, became part of the photo community. I luckily discovered that. I wasn't a good folk singer and became a photographer. And back in those days, it was possible to have friends like Ansel Adams, teacher in workshops, and Imogen Cunningham was also a friend. Here's a photograph she did of me when I was in my 20s. Another mentor and friend of mine was Wynne Bullock. So I um, had the luck of um, becoming part of a fine art community and began teaching at CCA. So I had a job as an educator, became friends with photographers like Sally Mann, that's Sally Mann sitting on my left. And the others are uh, members of an organization that we formed called the Image Continuum. So I became part of the fine art community and began doing black and white, very earnest images in black and white. These are just some examples of my work. I'm going by it pretty quickly. You, you're welcome to go to my uh, very neglected website to see more of my pictures. But I wanted to give you a sense of the kind of work that I did um, before a big change in my life. This is from a project that I did in Africa. But I mentioned that I was sort of witness to a lot of um, violence, um, but it was in my home. So this is a, this is a triptych that I did um, reenacting um, a child abuse incident that happened between myself and my mother. So this is the right um, panel. What you're seeing is a um, recreation of a fire that I started experimenting with matches in the broiler of my oven. Um, with a kind of collage of my family around me. And this is a recreation with light painting of um, my mother's punishment of me. 
So my work is, as you can see, I'm already trying to use art as a way to heal personal issues. So this is a um, collage that I made from, from text that my mother wrote in a journal that I gave her in the last few months of her life. Uh, and if you, if you go to my website and read it, you'll see that um, I'm sort of extracting um, words that she said about how much she loved my sisters and I. And just to give you a sense of how my relationship with my mother evolved, and again, I'm using my work as a way to kind of mediate this process of growth and healing. So this is a triptych that I did with my mother. And I'll just read the text that says, summer 1974, after years of silence and painful distance between us, I wanted her to see the important places of my life. When Yosemite came into view, she cried. She reluctantly agreed when I asked her to pose in front of a dead tree. Summer 1980, when her hair grew back after chemotherapy, we were surprised at how soft it felt. After we danced at my sister's wedding, I had to carry her down the stairs from the reception. We had never seen fear in her eyes before. And then winter 1980, a month before she died, she looked at me. We knew we were seeing each other for the last time. So again, I show you this background in order to give you a sense of just the way that art and specifically photography um, functioned as a, as a way for me to deal with um, pain and, um, and healing within my family. And that's the way my career would have gone until um, this artist, Suzanne Lacey, um, came to my school in the uh, early 90s. Um, Suzanne Lacey is a renowned performance artist and theorist and writer and educator. She came to my school as a dean. And this marked a really um, radical shift in my life. And it was uh, really a profound encounter. So she and I began having conversations about um, conditions happening in Oakland in those times. And um, I was inspired by a documentary by Bill Moyers done in the late 1980s called The Public Mind, which made me very interested in me media literacy and her concern with injustice on the streets of Oakland, particularly as it um, affected the lives of the young um, children of color, um, led to a collaboration. So here you see me with Oakland teachers um, working with um, them to put together a, sort of a media literacy curriculum for their classes. And that resulted in a project that Shannon mentioned, The Roof is on Fire, which was the first attempt on my part to collaborate on it on a process that was intended to try to make the inner lives of young kids of color um, understandable to the white world that usually wanted to um, portray them as um, a problem. So what we did over a number of years, a couple of years was um, organize young people in high schools in Oakland. Um, we, what you're seeing here is a garage in uh, downtown Oakland where we organized cars um, into a place where these young people who were wearing badges around their necks that said, shut up and listen, could gather and pretend to have private conversations. And the idea was to use this, this sort of performance process as a way to create a safe space for them to express themselves honestly. And the audience were, were told just to listen. And obviously it was profoundly liberating to the kids to not only be able to speak freely, but know that they were being heard within this sort of theatrical device. And it was a very powerful thing for me to witness. And um, this picture, I include because it actually led to an idea that evolved into Question Bridge. But you can see that the audience is very patiently listening um, to the um, voices of these young people and uh, obviously coming away with a real different understanding of who they were as human beings. So after that, um, again, as Shannon mentioned, we, we um, were able to organize a KRL and documentary and so people began to think of me as becoming um, more involved with um, performance art and social 
justice issues than my work. Um, so what happened was in 1996, the Museum of Photographic Arts in San Diego asked me to create a project to coincide with the Republican convention that was happening there. And they said, you know, we want you to deal with something related to um, an issue that is a pressing concern for you, and uh, but it has to be in video, which I at that point knew nothing about. So I thought back to that um, distance, that rupture that I witnessed um, to the black community where um, members of the black community who nominally belong to each other were really divided by geography and by class. And um, I thought to myself, well, is there a way that I could create some kind of performative mechanism that might help these people who clearly need each other um, communicate better? And I knew that bringing them together into one room um, and trying to facilitate a conversation uh, between people who lived in the hood um, and those who didn't, um, all African-Americans, I knew that that wouldn't work. Um, and I learned from the project I did with Suzanne how important listening could be as a creative um, force. Um, but I thought to myself, well, listening is a kind of passive way for a person to be very generous. Um, what would be a more active way for a person to be generous? And I realized that asking a question is inherently an active form of generosity. And I thought, well, what if I could set up a situation that would allow um, African-Americans who live in the suburbs who are part of the mainstream world to simply ask all the questions that I know that they have of African-Americans who've made the choice or because of circumstances live in the hood. Um, how can I get these two parts of black culture to communicate? I wonder if it would work if I got them to um, look into a video camera and simply ask the question as if they're talking to this other person, would, would they do that? It was a creative experiment. And um, if they could only ask a question and then answer a question of someone in video form, I wonder if that would work. And if, if so, it would create a kind of question bridge between these people. And I thought question bridge, that has a nice ring to it. So that's how question bridge emerged. And that's how it connects to that early experience that I noticed growing up about the black community dividing, because I realized that any demographic has um, critical divisions within it, that this system of simply asking and answering questions mediated by video might work. So this is how the original question bridge um, coal and black community looked um, back in 1996. And it's understandably very crude because I, again, was learning a lot about lighting and video, but, um, but this will give you a sense of how that experiment worked and how it looked and sounded. Have you given any thought to where the money comes from for people who are receiving public assistance? And do you care? I thought about where public assistance money comes from, and I do care. But for one, I am on public assistance. And um, it's not because we don't want to work. It's not because we want to sit at home and get a check or anything like that. A lot of people perceive us young teenage mo mothers to sit at home and just collect a check where a lot of times we do go out and look for work. We do work. We we can't work as long because childcare is really up there. At this point in time, I pay $300 a month for one child and I have two and I pay $158 a month for another child. The 300 is because my child is under two. The 150 is because my child is over two in his school age. So yes, I know where the money comes from, it comes from taxpayers, but we do have people who take up American jobs who are not taxpayers because they're not an um, American citizen. How about that? Uh, we get decreases in our checks because we are American citizens, but yet if you're a refugee or you're an immigrant or you're able working alien, legal working alien in the United States, you get an increase in your check when you come over here from different countries because the United States government have um, so-called some kind of agreement with them. They come over here and they're able to get grants to start businesses where we are already living here, working, doing the backbone of the, of the country. And we don't get that same type of respect, but yet people look down upon us because we are on public assistance. They like to say, oh, the black teenage mom, they're 
going out, opening their legs and having babies just to get on welfare to get out the house. That is not always the case. It's a small proportion that does that, but you only focus on the small proportion. So you can imagine how it felt for me um, watching this experiment unfold. And I'm showing this picture of Hank Willis Thomas because um, Hanks um, came to my school as a graduate student um, years later. And I showed him that original um, one hour Question Bridge Black Community. And he went away with the impression that um, you know, there was maybe something to this that could be developed. And 12 years later, um, Hank called me and said, you know, that was a really powerful experiment you did. Um, and I've got access to a grant from the Tribeca Film Foundation. What would you think about doing another version of that? Um, so I had, you know, originally thought that it was uh, a powerful idea and tried to market it, but um, life overwhelmed me and I went on with other things. And that project probably would have just sat on VHS tapes forever, if not for Hank's um, prompting. Um, I had sent a copy of it to his mother, Deb Willis, and uh, they were going through their VHS collection. And that's how it came back to his attention. So Hank called me and said, why don't we do a collaboration? But in this case, why don't we use the same idea working within one demographic? Um, but there were a couple of innovations. One was he suggested that instead of predicting what the dividing line between the people on either sides of the question bridge could be, maybe we should just allow them to um, frame their own question. So the prompt was look into the camera and as a black man, um, ask a question that you've always wanted to ask another black man who's different from you and just see what happens. So first of all, the idea of not including African-American women um, was controversial for me. Um, you saw how powerful the voice of Kiana Johnson was. Um, but, you know, Hank made a very good point. We're talking about 2007 um, when we did this. So this is actually before um, the rise of Barack Obama. Um, but, you know, I thought it might work. So that's, that's how Hank and his work, and if you know anything about Hank's work, um, it's so appropriate to this theme of race and, and uh, healing that I'm trying to use because Hank's work was motivated by um, the murder of his beloved cousin Sangha. Um, here's just a few examples of his very early work that he was doing just after graduate school. So once again, this is another one of these collaborations where there was a real kinship. Um, Kamal Sinclair was a friend of Hank's. Um, she was a choreographer, a dancer, um, but also an MBA, a really brilliant artist. And at one point in the project um, that we decided to do, um, we knew we needed more sort of business sense and uh, Kamal became one of the key collaborators. And Baite Ross Smith was also a graduate student at um, CCA. And so the three of us became a team. Um, actually the four of us became a team um, who created Question Bridge Black Males. Um, this is a little bit of Baite's work, dealing with code switching, for example. So that's how Question Bridge Black Males came into being. Um, and just to give you a sense of how the, um, the project looks um, with, uh, with Black men as a focus, here's Here's a, just an excerpt of Question Bridge Black Males showing the same methodology applied to um, Black men speaking to each other through this format. You know, I wonder, Black man, are you really ready for freedom? And if not, what will it take for you to want and need this freedom? So just again, to give you a sense of the methodology, the um, you know, the gathering of questions like this creates an imperative to find the appropriate answer. So um, this man asked this question completely um, on his own. And I started thinking, so where could I find relevant answers to the question of are black men ready for freedom? Um, so I actually spent more than a year and a half working with the San Francisco police authorities and I was able to get into um, 
the uh, county jail in San Bruno and presented that question in that form to an inmate in, uh, in the city jail. And here's the answer. Am I ready for freedom? And what would it take to me to want that freedom? First, I would have to stop and ask myself, and I would have to, that's, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Because freedom to me is a mind state, you know, because you got some people that's not in jail, that's not free. You know, you got people that's in prison in dysfunctional relationship. You got people that's in prison with jobs. They work nine to five that they don't like. Some people are in prison with alcohol and drug abuse. So I would have to, um, I would have had to really ask myself what's in prison in me. And what's been in prison in me is my self-esteem, my lack of self-esteem. My lack of self-esteem has led me to commit crime, to hurt people, to manipulate people, right? Because if I love myself, there's no way I could walk around, walk outside this room and punch somebody if I'm esteemed within myself. So to be free to me would have to be, I would have to change, you know? So in order for me to grow it, I have to change because if change is necessary for growth. In order for me to grow, I would have to adapt the, I would have to adapt the mentality of something that's got to change in me, I would have to change my mind state. I'd have to change the way I talk. I'd have to change the people I, I interact with. That would be free. So once again, I, I think you can see one of the um, really almost mesmerizing things about what happens when you give people a chance to um, honestly express themselves in um, the proper setting. So um, just like Kiana Johnson early on, you can see Ivan here. Um, really offering insights that he's obviously been thinking a lot about. And the idea of the project was just to offer those insights to both himself and to the world. And so that's how Question Bridge Black Males came to be. And the team um, and I spent four years of summers traveling around the country, gathering questions and answers in a portable studio that we would set up in New Orleans or um, all over. And you can see here, another dimension of the collaboration, um, because I would be behind the camera as kind of the director um, setting up the lighting, um, and Hank would be on the um, laptop looking at the sort of collections of questions that we would gather, and he would decide which questions to be directed toward different persons. Um, so sometimes I didn't even know what questions we were presenting to a given um, sitter. Um, but that's the way the project evolved. Um, but then we had the challenge of figuring out what to do with this incredible collection of material that we created. Um, when um, I put together a, a timeline of all of the footage after four years that felt like relevant questions, um, eliminating sort of repeated questions in the proper order, we ended up with uh, 15 hours worth of material. Um, so then um, translating it from that raw form into the form of an installation that would work in museums um, is another story. But this is an example of the way the um, installation piece evolved. This is the way it looked at the Sundance Film Festival. And you can see, you know, we created these, we call them sort of avatars um, that represent the, the men. And maybe you can notice that the, um, pillars are established into a kind of arc that includes the audience. So that's a sense of the way the installation looks. And if you, um, someday we'll all be able to go to museums again, but the Oakland Museum has an installation in their permanent collection where you can see a version of this. And of course, um, it goes without saying that in museums, um, it attracted a tremendous amount of attention from the African American community. Um, and here's an example of the way the five um, channel version of it um, looks when you um, play it um, as a single channel piece. This may seem like a silly question, but I wanna know, am I the only one who has problem eating chicken, watermelon and bananas in front of white people? <laughs> 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 I don't have a problem with it, curious. <laughs> no, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I don't even eat watermelon because of the connotations that 
it has around uh, black people. Um, but I will eat some chicken. <laughs> I never heard of bananas. Man. I never heard of bananas. bananas really? Huh. I don't know if you're the only one, but it is not a problem for me to eat whatever I want to eat from anybody. You're not the only one, brother. To be honest, um, every every time I still eat chicken, I eat a lot of watermelon, and I love bananas. But I'm always looking over my shoulder wherever I'm at, seeing who's watching me eat this watermelon and this piece of chicken, and this banana, always. Um, You're not the only one. No, I know plenty of African-Americans who, as a rule, will not eat watermelon in front of white folks. Now, for me, I have difficulty relating to the question only in the sense that I've never, ever liked watermelon, and I don't eat meat. So I don't find myself in the situation where chicken and watermelon comes to a head. But I do know that there are times where you feel like you are the stereotype because, you know, if they say, hey, do you want to go play some basketball? And of course I love basketball. I played it every single day. But there's a part of me that wants to say, no, I don't want to play any uh, basketball. What makes you think I, I want to play basketball? But in those moments, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and just know that there are some things that are true. Yes, you know, we like chicken, we like watermelon, and there's nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not a sweet question, brother. My family sells 50,000 pounds of watermelons every week in the streets of South Chicago, Milwaukee, and Gary, Indiana, and have been since 1953. And we're okay with that. And by the way, I like fried chicken. In fact, I'm gonna make something up. I don't know if you're the only one ashamed. Um, I'm I'm not ashamed, but I do give I do give chicken a second thought sometimes, even when I mention it. But I always pass it off as sort of like in a jokey joke way because I do love chicken. Um, watermelon, I don't eat watermelon so much, so I I'm not really so much ashamed of it. Um, bananas, I hadn't thought about bananas because I always think about a banana banana because I'm gay in a sexual way. So when I put, when I put a banana, I'm always self-conscious in front of anybody just because of sexuality, but not because of race. I think really that question leads to a deeper question. Why are we so concerned with what they think about us? I mean, you know, that's what the real question is. I don't really care. You know, I know somewhere in there I do care, but in my consciousness and what I'm going to say, I don't really care what they think. You know, uh, I don't need their approval in order for me to go ahead and be me or order for me to do my job, you know, or order for me to be who I'm going to be. I don't need their approval. I don't need their job. None of that. You know, um, I think it's really important that we stop worrying about what they think. Start worrying about what you think about yourself and maybe what the little black kid next door to you thinks about you. Like so white person thinking what they think about you, your watermelon, or anything else, your shoes, your jacket, you know, your hat backwards. I don't go with the sagging pants, but you know, whatever you're doing, that's because it's your cultural identity or your food or whatever. What they think about is not really important. So, you know, I wanted to let that play out because I wanted to give you a sense of the way that the order of the sequences. Um, really allows us, you know, as the editors of this to tell the story. And there's one other person that I want to give credit to, and that is Rosa White. Um, as I mentioned, uh, when I did the first rough cut of the Question Bid project, it was 15 hours just to include what I thought was the most relevant material. She boiled it down to the three hour version that's now the installation. Um, and so, so many of the really brilliant um, formal relationships between speaking people who weren't in each other's presence were the result of um, her editing brilliance. So I just always want, want to give her a shout out for, for that. But after doing the project um, and seeing how it was received by people at the Oakland Museum and the Brooklyn Museum and the Sundance Film Festival, we, we realized that we had something that was much more than just um, an art installation. So. Um, we were able to get support um, 
to really look critically at exactly what this document that we had created um, was. And we realized that it was a transmedia project that needed to exist in lots of different forms, um, that it needed to be presented to more than just an art audience. So we raised money, created um, a website. Um, I created um, a series of public events called the um, Blueprint Roundtables. Um, the idea of the Blueprint Roundtables were um, inspired by a quote that you, you heard, you know, where this man asked, um, you know, why didn't you leave us a blueprint? And um, I thought, well, you know, there are young people all over the country who would love to be able to ask questions like that and get answers from elders. Um, so I created public events um, all over the country, you know, where black men um, of different ages were able to ask and answer questions. Um, and of course, uh, once again, it really attracts a lot of support from the black community. So the, the, the rules were that only black men could ask and answer questions in that format. Um, and it turned out to be really powerful. Um, as I mentioned, the website is the place where you can go to questionbridge.com and see all of the footage that didn't make it into the installation, but it also was a place where the mobile app that we were able to develop um, allowed Black men um, to upload questions and answer them um, through um, their phones and, uh, and tablets. So again, you know, the project, you know, as an art piece um, had, um, still has a continuing life and the culmination of that um, was the uh, adoption of the project into the Smithsonian African Museum in Washington, um, where it's in their permanent collection. And Aperture published a book on it. But there's one other dimension of it that actually um, is very much in play now with the book and um, the installations. Oh, okay, so these are just some other projects that I've done. Um, this is, I created a media wall for the Oakland airport. And this is a installation at the Exploratorium. It's, it's called the Wisdom of Time Machine where it allows you to ask a question of your um, younger or older self. This is the way that project looks. Um, I created an installation for the Oakland Museum called Who is Oakland? My contribution to it was this project called The Best Way to Find a Hero. Coming from um, the hood myself, um, I know that um, if you were to throw a dart at a black community um, and go to talk to people under the dart, you're most likely going to find uh, a hardworking family trying to make a living. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I threw darts at a map that was a conglomeration of all of the bad neighborhoods supposedly in New York, in, uh, in Oakland. And, uh, and I went and videotaped interviews with people who were under the darts. And uh, so that's just another example of, of me sort of trying to raise consciousness about an issue that I had insight from for my life. This is another project that I did more recently called um, the Open Fence Project. This is a photograph of my barber, somebody who I miss very much at the moment, um, who uh, was a, uh, uh, you can see that he's a sort of community organizer. That his barbershop is called the Pull Up Your Pants Barbershop. So these are just some more recent projects. For the Oakland Museum, I created this project called The Question of Faith based on this um, famous quote, made famous by Martin Luther King, who was really originally done by Theodore Parker, the Ark of the Moral Universe. This was done for the midterm elections um, in order to provide some hope in the midst of uh, the Trump era. Um, the, um, the photographs were images by Dorothy Lang that I discovered from the um, Library of Congress. And this, this became billboards and posters all over Oakland and San Francisco. other billboard 
mockups. And these these were the bus shelter versions of it. But again, um, speaking about the sort of ongoing life of Question Bridge, um, one of the things that uh, became clear very early on was that it was really important for the voices of these black men um, and their faces to be available for young people um, to hear and see. And so um, very early on, uh, we created a curriculum, which I'll be sharing with you. So if you go to the Question Bridge website and you click on the Educate button, it'll take you to what we call the Educator Portal. Um, and so these are distillations of themes from the project that are available for free to teachers who want to use these themes together with um, materials developed by Kamal and this incredible group of brilliant women. Um, they created the original Question Bridge curriculum back in 2012. And I since then updated it together with um, James Ford in um, North Carolina. So we created the new version of it. And so this is the way the Question Bridge modules look when you click on one of those icons. It takes you to um, a place where you can, you can download clips from it that are directed toward um, six specific themes. There also are art projects um, in the form of student workbooks and teacher guides that we provide to educators um, to provide a support system for teachers um, to use the resource that I've been working with a museum in North Carolina, the Harvey Gantt Center to create um, a teacher development program. So I've been back there doing workshops with teachers to use the question bridge materials in their classrooms. This is a shot that we did in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is a screenshot of the um, PDFs that we provide to teachers to use with their students. And I'm currently in conversations with uh, these schools, the Mulberg School, the Princeton Day School, and more locally, the Black Pines Circle School um, to uh, promote the curriculum in their classrooms. And a more current project that I've been working on creative documentation of six organizations that have been trying to incorporate um, art into community development projects. And so um, this is just another project that I've been working on for the past actually three years. Um, this is a still from a project done in a very, very small town, um, Myland, Minnesota, where they, a community development organization um, hired an artist to create a musical theater piece that used all of the residents of the, the small little town um, to create a piece called This Land is Myland. Um, so that's just an example of the kind of community development collaborations that are being done in these six organizations um, that I've been documenting. And if this is the last slide. Okay. So that's a quick overview of uh, the life and work of Chris Johnson. Let me turn my light back on. Hey, Chris, that was an incredible overview. And thank you for, for your generosity in sharing so much. Um, and so many connections and genealogies um, that led up to the work as well as the different platforms and new iterations of Question Bridge. It was really incredible, thank you. I we have, um, you have been, while you've been speaking, there's just been a lot of really strong, powerful reactions in the chat to your work. And I think we're gonna together start, start to sift through and make some of these um, um, awesome, amazing comments into questions for you. Um, uh, those who are tuning in, we, we'd have the possibility of unmuting you so you could ask your question um, out loud to Chris. So perhaps you can 
let us know if you'd like to be unmuted because there's some really great thoughts here. Maybe I'll just start off to get things going and you know, thinking about some of the things that have already been said in the chat, Chris, that when you talked about being a photographer and doing that incredible powerful work um, as a photographer, creating stills, and then with Suzanne Lacey entering your world and um, the realm of performance and um, public art being um, you know, part of your practice, I wonder like, if you could say um, a bit more about what you see as is possible with these different media. The, the, what can be done with a still photograph, what can be done with a video piece, um, but also noticing that the questioning and answering could be happening live in real time and shared space rather than on the screen. What does the screen as the way as the mode of questioning and answering do or not do? What are its capacities? Um, a thought that we're all having also, given that so much of what, you know, of any kind of intimacy right now often is happening over screens. It's um, an extra, there's an extra resonance to the question, I suppose. Sure, yeah. Well, that's a very profound question, obviously, because what you're talking about is um, how do the different formal um, constraints and um, enhancements of, a, of one form versus another reach people in different ways. Um, and th that's the way I think of it. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you could, you could see the arc of my work being the evolution of a person who <laughs> started out as a folk singer, who realized that he was not able to communicate as well <laughs> as I wanted to. That way I had, frankly, no talent for it. But, but as a form of, um, art as social change, we all, we all know how powerful music is. Um, and that obviously impressed me as a young kid in Brooklyn. Um, and then, you know, just by circumstance discovered um, that still photography could translate the process of seeing something relevant to someone else. And I, I, I believed in that and, and had more of an aptitude for that than focusing, um, so <laughs> I adopted that. Um, but then, um, the, the, the evolution really of um, my understanding of how art can function as, as a medium of, of change happened when Suzanne made it clear to me. And, and you know, there are lots of um, history to the performance art capital. I mean, there's a lot to say about that, but, but obviously what it does when you enact something, um, when you are able to engage people um, in real time in an event that they believe uh, because of their own empirical experience, um, that has a kind of impact that a photograph inherently doesn't have. It's just different. It engages you in a different way. And I think when you understand that um, your your goal as a change agent is to try to reach people where they are in the most effective way um, that the message you're trying to convey can can offer, um, you get resourceful about, about yeah. how to find a way into people's heads and hearts um, in, in, through a medium that will work. Um, and you know, as you can see, you know, I, I stumbled on um, the format of using direct video of a person that it was before Facebook, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, I, 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 was, I was reacting to the immediacy of looking someone in the eye and asking them a question. I thought, well, what can I do to recreate that? So that's that's why I chose video as a form, and and I hope I conveyed, you know, that it was really a discovery for me that this process of having people look into a camera, ask a question as if they're visualizing the person on the other end of it. Right. I discovered just by doing it that that worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the people would ask really vulnerable questions. And the people would look at a video of the person asking the question and offer a tremendously disclosing and, and yes. honest answer. Well, I saw that happening and thought, my God, this is working. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, these um, forms really are efforts that we make kind of desperately to try to, um, to get our points across and, we, and you make it work. Um, and they do touch people in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That was uh, incredibly eloquent. And I think it resonates with what a lot of people are noticing or experiencing with of what you shared. 
Um, Edgar and Casey, maybe you can help me with um, if, if um, whether we, people have volunteered already to ask their question orally um, or whether we ask them to. Um, yeah, we've had a few questions in the chat and we have one member of the audience, Annika, um, with her hand raised. So Annika, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, hi, Chris. I'm like a big fan of your work. And I was wondering if you could expand more on your like specific choice to only include black men and not just like black men and women in some of your later like question bridge videos and like what you think the effect of that choice was. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, well, you know, it, it's really um, important for me to try to, um, to get people to feel as comfortable and safe as they can in the settings that I create in order, in order to disclose um, as much as they can about what they really feel about the issues that are, are at stake. And so that's why I work within a demographic as opposed to between demographics. There are other iterations of the question bridge form that are done across demographics, but, but I, I don't do them that way because, because I'm really interested in um, number one, creating the most safe setting for people to speak. And black men speaking to other black men um, are simply more honest about a wider range of issues than they would be if they were speaking to black women. Um, in fact, we, we noticed um, that if Kamal was anywhere in the room when the black men <laughs> were sitting for us, um, they, they behaved differently. Um, if we could create what felt like a safe setting for, for, for the black men to speak to each other about issues that were relevant to black male consciousness, it worked better. Um, and you know, I've, I've done more recently a project, um, white women in, Amer in America. And of course, I as, as a black man couldn't be anywhere near you know, the setting of those. It had to be white women who were doing the project in order for the women to feel safe. Um, and so that's, that's really why, um, you know, black women weren't included in the first um, black males project. Um, we really wanted to see what would happen when black men felt as if they were speaking to themselves. And on a deeper level, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get at the kind of internal dialogue that, that happens between a person and him or herself. I mean, I'm really interested in my own thought processes where it's me as a black man speaking to me as a black man. Um, so, so I'm trying to recreate that sense of inner um, voice. Um, and, I, and I hope that the projects work that way. So much, thanks so much for that answer, Chris, because it does sort of show that it's, it's not just inclusion um, that, it, that encourages people to think about issues of gender but that really actually some, to some degree, the feminist goals of the piece might actually come out when you create this other structure, you know? So thanks for that question, Annika, as well as the answer. Other thing, other thoughts brewing? Yeah, I'm gonna read a question from the Q&A um, from Zane Shields. Um, and the question is on the topic of different mediums of communication of art, what ways did you see the responses and interactions with Question Bridge change in the different forms it was presented in? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, maybe maybe a good way to get at the um, different reactions to different forms would be to speak about the uh, the public events that I that I mentioned, um, because there I tried to create um, a Question Bridge like setting, but live. <laughs> um, without the video as a mediator. Um, so the question was, and again, it was just an experiment. I, I didn't know whether or not um, that sense of safety and privacy would carry into a public setting, um, but I discovered that it did. Um, the fact is that, that people, particularly people who feel marginalized, um, have a powerful desire to, to feel safe and to speak them, speak their own minds. I mean, the way I have, came to think of it is that, you know, a kid walking down the street um, with his pants hanging low um, knows that people are silently asking him the question, why do you wear your pants so low? And so he, he carries 
he walks under a cloud of these questions and he's answering them in his own mind. Um, so so my, my goal is to figure out a way to, to get those questions that he's rehearsing to himself out into the open. And I discovered that um, even in a public setting, if you tell people, you know, I really want to hear you. Um, and the rule was um, the women and non-Black males in the audience can't confront you. <laughs> um, it still worked. So um, again, I think it's, it worked because it speaks to a real strong desire all of us have to be heard. And we have another um, hand raised in the audience. Frankly, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Um, hello, Mr. Johnson. I uh, hope you're doing well today. Um, I'm personally from uh, the inner city in Los Angeles. And so I kind of wanted to ask you this question um, more of like as a mentor standpoint instead of an artistic standpoint. Um, what advice would you give kids who struggle to free themselves from the untrue and naive realities that are brainwashed in them. Well, well, the, the first and most important thing, frankly, is for you and, and for all of these young brothers and sisters in those situations to know yourself. Um, that the first thing you have to do is find a way to connect to what is your truth. Um, Maybe you, you get there through music or maybe you get there through talking to each other. Um, but once you find a way to cultivate um, what for you is a personal truth, what I can assure you is that if you connect deeply enough to that truth, you will eventually need to find a way to express it. I mean, that's been my experience for how that process works. It begins by creating a critical mass within yourself of truth that you believe in, and then you find a way. Um, art is one way. Um, there are lots of other ways. Public service is, is a way. Um, just helping your neighbors. One of the things that you'll discover is that there's an exhaustible um, community of need around all of us. Um, so when you believe enough in your own truth, you'll you'll find the resources to spread that truth and help others. Um, but but that's, that's the way it evolves. It's a process of, of knowing yourself and then giving yourself permission um, to speak that truth in any way that you can. Um, we, we, in the art world, we, we, we think of it as um, finding your voice, um, whatever, whatever that is. Um, and um, one of the things about being human is that we have many, many different kinds of voices. You know, all the different art forms represent different ways that individuals have found um, to express themselves, and you will. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Thanks for that reaction. Frankly, is one of many students who are going to Berkeley remotely. I think Frankly's in LA now. And, you know, and uh, thanks for, you know, also reinforcing that we can be part of a community here or that you could be contributing to that community even right now, Chris, thanks. Um, I also am getting texts as well as other um, notifications that Suzanne Lacey is herself in the audience and she um, would love a chance to say hi and um, share her voice um, with us if we could unmute her. Hi. Hey. Hey, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> I never get tired of seeing Question Bridge. God, it was amazing. I love, I love that piece. And um, you are, I, I got to tell everybody in the audience, this guy's super humble, but he is probably one of the best teachers I have known. He's influenced my work as much as I've influenced his. And, you know, what we always said about her, about Chris is he was kind of our resident philosopher. You always have the humanistic, the personal, the social, the broad philosophical overview all combined together. So you indeed are a mentor to so many people, including the kids we worked with. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, and I bet the audience is uh, about what you're working on now, because I know you're doing that big project while you're, where you're sort of traveling all over and applying Question Bridge in, in deeply political ways. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, you know, I tried to touch on that a little bit. The, um, the project working um, with community development organizations as a documentarian is actually coming to fruition. I mean, it took me to Alaska, to the Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, um, to Jackson, Mississippi, to Philadelphia and Los Angeles, as you know. Um, so pulling all of that together into a website that presents um, creative placemaking as a genre um, is, that's coming to fruition. So we're, we're doing the final editing of that and the, um, the, the soft launch <laughs> of that's gonna happen soon. Um, but the ongoing um, project, Suzanne, which you know really is a mission of itself, is responding to the the need that teachers have to to use the Question Bridge curricular modules um, in their classrooms. I mean, my vision is to have the project not just in the few schools you know that I've been able to cultivate it, but everywhere. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, you can imagine, Suzanne, you know, what it's what it's like to have your work become part of a, you know, school curriculum. Yeah. yeah. Supported supported by superintendents and teachers, and you know, um, so that's that's becoming, you know, an ongoing mission because you know it really at this point no longer um, I no longer have the team around me. It's just me, <laughs> you know, trying trying to do that. So figuring out how to scale that up and, um, and get it out um, is, is an ongoing project. And on a more personal level, you know, I still take pictures. <laughs> so, um, so I tried to touch on some of the things that have come up, you know, the, the billboard projects and those kinds of things mm -hmm. always seem to, to be there. Um, what about your idea of um, the divide now between deep conservatives and uh, the more progressive people in this country. It's certainly something I'm pondering yeah. all the time. How do I deal with the Central Valley in my thinking? Because as you know, I'm from the Central Valley and yeah. um, you know, the kind of conspiracies, the, the sort of subversion of Christianity that's yeah. going on now. That's to me, that's a divide that God, I'd love to see you apply your intelligence to that. What, what could we possibly do to outclass what Stacey Abrams is doing? Exactly. No, she's not bridging the divide. She's just getting vote, voting out. But yeah. how do you start that conversation? I think we're all puzzling over that. Yeah, I don't, you know, just being witness to it is so overwhelming, Suzanne, yeah. Yeah. that it, it, it's hard to know how to do more than just be uh, an honest witness to this history that's unfolding right in front of our eyes. Um, but but how to really engage it, which is the question you're asking, yeah. is something that, um, you know, we'll have to talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our next project, Tolera. There you go. There you go. <laughs> thank you so much, Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. We have uh, some more questions coming in the Q&A. Um, one question about the participation or invitation of black trans men in Question Bridge and how that looked over the years. Yeah, um, so I mean, there are two answers to that, um, two parts to that. Like one has to do with, with um, the decision that we made to, to allow men to identify themselves. <laughs> we didn't um, you know, pre-categorize people um, in terms of their participation. Anyone who wanted to define themselves as a black male um, were fine with us. <laughs> and, and so we took them up in, in their own terms and included them that way. Um, and then the, um, the website you know, with input through the mobile app gave people a chance to once again self-define and um, tag themselves and participate and upload their question and answer through um, through that, um, so so in a way, you know, that giving permission to people um, to self-define just um, allowed for a diversity that we couldn't have planned for, <laughs> um, and we just honor it when when it exists. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, I wanted to read another question here from the Q&A from Michelle Williams. Uh, what do you think is most important for current artists to capture uh, using the volume of media today to record and catalog the protests, removal of monuments, of schools, as well as other important results of the continued protests to injustice? I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Uh, is the question like how best to capture the flow of history as it goes rushing past us? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's like, oh, ask. We could ask Michelle, if Michelle, if you want to um, be unmuted, you could also um, amplify. Yeah, please do. Oh, hi. Um, thank you for taking my question. And what an incredible catalog of work. I really appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. Um, so yes, that's exactly, you know, as it goes rushing by us, how, how do you sift through so much visual information and, you know, capture really the essence, like if you were going to create a time capsule, in other words, of what we're going through right now, what would you say would be the most important elements to, to that? Yeah, well, um, Michelle is your name? Yes. Yeah, um, so one of the first things I would say is recognize that you're already um, filtering um, the flow of it by, by paying attention to what's most meaningful to you. I mean, out of that vast flow, there are certain things that catch your attention and other things that don't. Um, also, of course, the medium that you choose, um, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever, you know, that is a filter through which um, you are hearing some things and not hearing other things. So there's a process of discrimination happening organically, right? By what catches your attention. And the more you pay attention to what you pay attention to, the more you realize that what's floating to the surface for you are the things that are most meaningful. So once you recognize that, figuring out how to um, embody those meanings, because the meanings are the most important things, right? Um, so in the same way, like my wife and I did, uh, a 17 mile hike across San Francisco. And, you know, as a photographer, we were sensitized to um, paying attention to what you're paying attention to. So you photographed little things and it ended up being a kind of catalog of, of our walks. And that's a similar kind of process, I think. Um, so I would just say, that the more you recognize, you know, that the most important thing you're doing is making meaning, um, the more you'd be able to discriminate and, and embody those meanings in a form that um, you would want to um, keep and then share. That's great, thank you for that. So um, we have another question from a student and this one's about question bridge. Um, the student writes, I thought it would be very interesting to find correlations between the answers that people gave and other factors shared by these individuals, mm -hmm. such as economic background, age, et cetera. Yeah. So did you find any such correlations or patterns? Yeah, so there are a couple of things. Um, it was really important for us, as I mentioned earlier, for people to self-define. Um, so when we created the website, what we did was, um, allow them to create what we called identity tags. So they could say, you know, that I am um, a brother, uh, I'm a pastor, I'm a father, you know, I come from. So we allowed them to, to tag themselves with as many identifiers as they thought were relevant to their identity. Because one of the goals of the project was to help black men understand that they could self-define through this project. So that, that allows people who go to the website to see um, how people self-identify and then sort their answers in relationship to that context that, that men created around themselves of um, what was important and what was not. Um, and that's the way we felt was the most fair and had the greatest integrity um, for, for doing that. Does that answer your question? Oh, I'm sorry, right. I think, yeah, no, I think that does. I mean, and raise your hand, Giuseppe, if you want to um, jump in there and ask the question um, or a follow-up question yourself. 
but um yeah i think that was part of the question and then also if you happen to yourself notice any interesting resonances or patterns amongst oh, yeah. populations um i honestly feel as if it's another project <laughs> to go back to why someone um, would ask a particular question because you know that all the questions and answers, but particularly the questions are loaded. I mean, that there's a reason why a particular person would ask a question. And another iteration of Question Bridge that I would love to get the funding to do would be to go back and say, okay, um, tell me why that particular question was relevant for you. Uh, that would give us insight into the nature of the question, but also um, into you as a human being. But I haven't had the chance to do that. <laughs> so. Yeah, but it's great. It's like the questions themselves are revealing of the Absolutely. individuals. One thing I wanted to see if you could elaborate a little bit more on that also um, just thinking about some of the reactions during the presentation, there were really strong reactions um, and you know, actually, you know, um, I think people were very moved by the, the editing of the texts and the jumping from person to person um, and also, you know, keeping up channels. Um, sometimes people, um, uh, pe people, the uh, a camera was up even if a person wasn't speaking. Mm -hmm. And I know you, you know, you credited collaborator collaborators with that editing. But I just wonder about if you could say a little bit more about those decisions um, to create that installation placed on pillars mm -hmm. with seats with. Um, you know, channels going in and out in different ways. Um, that aspect of this hybrid medium. Yeah. Shannon, there's so much to say about that. Um, well, look, let me just offer the first sort of technical insight. Um, you know, I did all the shooting, um, so I'm behind the camera. And one of the things that you learn um, when you do video documentary projects like this is that you need to have um, what are called handles. You need to have um, enough footage before the person speaks. And then, of course, they speak in response to the question. And then you need to have some on camera time after um, in order to um, create smooth transitions. And so you have to visualize people with a monitor here that has the question. And so I'm filming them looking to the right or left, looking at a question being asked them. And then they turn and engage with the camera. So. Rosa, the editor, had all of that footage of men looking to the right and to the left and, and looking thoughtfully into space, right? So, so she, she saw that as an opportunity to create the illusion that people on one, one monitor, right, was actually in real time listening to a person someplace else. Um, that was Rosa, well, first of all, you know, I provided the handoffs and simply because I was being a good documentarian, but she provided the insight for how to use that to create the impression of real listening and speaking. Um, another formal thing, which I, I made you know, reference to, was we, we laid out, we, we had to decide as a team how to create the most effective installation. And we realized that having um, the video footage flat on a wall would work differently than having it actually in space. Um, the difference is that um, when it's in space and, and the monitors are organized on those pillars in an arc, and we, we laid out specifically what kind of arc, like how, how many degrees you know, um, a curve would work, we wanted the, the monitors to be organized in a way that implied a circle that the viewer was included in. And, and that made them feel however they were inclined to feel about being surrounded by black men. <laughs> and, and so it worked that way. And it, so that's why we, we specified those parameters when, um, when we designed installation. I hope that gets at it. I mean, there's much more to say about that. Oh, awesome, thank you. Yeah, yeah. it connects the dots with, between a, a lot of things that we've been thinking about with the students so far as well, about what it is to also put a moving image in space, you know, um, and, and multiple moving images in space. Yeah, just just the phenomenology of experiencing something 
that you can't get away from them <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's not flat on the wall. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what um, yeah. we wanted to do. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're getting to the, um, we're starting to um, getting to the, uh, needing to wind down a little bit by if there are some last thoughts or questions um, from our crew in the audience or from Edgar and Casey. I definitely have a question I'd love to ask as an artist who works with people. Um, is there something that you've learned in working with people, especially as you're kind of naming, creating an intimate space and, you know, helping people feel like they can externalize what they have internally? Is there something that you've learned kind of about being an artist who then kind of becomes more relational or works with communities? Yeah, I think that um, you have to be as vulnerable as an artist, as you want your sitter to be. <laughs> and, and that's an easy thing to say, um, but it's not so easy to actualize. Um, there's always you know, a moment of looking within yourself and saying, okay, I know why I wanna be here. I know why I want this person to trust me. Um, so I'm going to try to be as um, open as I can be. Um, and as vulnerable as I can be. And I think if you go in with that mindset, it's going to work better. I mean, I, I learned that very early on when I realized that portraiture was my, was my medium, not rocks and trees. Like, I, you know, my initial mentors were, you know, people like Ansel Adams and, you know, that was great. But, um, you know, but when I realized that, I, that working with people um, was the way that I needed to express myself, I, I realized that, what I'm doing is I'm taking projections of myself um, and seeing them in other people and then using that as the process of creation. And I think when you realize that there is this reciprocity always going on, you know how to be more present. And that's what makes whatever encounter you have more real. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that answer, Chris. I have a question too, but this question is a bit about portraiture and self-portraiture. Because hmm. um, in the class, um, a couple of weeks ago, we read an essay by Frederick Douglass where he is responding to photography as a very new medium. And one of the observations he makes is that this is sort of the first time that anyone can be, um, can have a portrait of themselves, can sort of see themselves in the sort of authority of the portrait. Um, and so, and you know, also because it seems like some of your earlier work was sort of working in the mode of portraiture. I'm wondering if you see Question Bridge as an act of portraiture. I, I do. About that. Um, and then also just thinking about, you know, selfie culture today and how much we take pictures of ourselves and are sort of constantly representing ourselves to the world. If you see there's something about a sort of a different space like Question Bridge where you're seeing yourself through the eyes of others um, as something um, sort of separate or different from the sort of constant self-portraiture that we're doing online. Yeah, today. well, I mean, I, I mean, there's so much in what you said, Caitlin, that I, I, I think um, is, is so true. I mean, um, the um, hyper-awareness <laughs> that Frederick Douglass had of, of how his presence would carry through history um, um, speaks, you can see that in looking at his pictures. You can see how much authority and integrity he brought to the process of being a sitter, um, representing his people, knowing, you know, as he did, um, what that would mean. And, and I think it's, it's true, anybody who engages in um, certainly the act of self-portraiture, um, I mean, which is what he was doing basically in a way, um, recognizes that you're asserting a kind of power about your projected identity. And so then you have to be as honest as you can be about um, are you projecting um, your true self? <laughs> you know, how much, how much are you really trying to mirror yourself to yourself? Um, and how much are you speaking to an audience and who is the audience? I mean, the more clear you can be about who you are addressing this image of yourself to, um, the more nuanced the exchange can be. Um, it's a tremendously complex thing. Um, and, you know, I, I usually tell my students who, who do this, 
um, that if you want to try to find the place where there is the most integrity, um, start out by assuming that no one but you is going to see these images. What are you going to make? Like do self-portraiture just, uh, it's an artifact, you know, but, but try it, see, see what would happen if you, you know, don't consider um, this to be the privilege of anyone but yourself to see. What, what would you do? Um, that's where I think, you know, that's the, that's the mentality of the Francesca Woodmans, for example. That, that's where it comes from. It comes from that kind of integrity. And it's, it's rich and very powerful when you see it. Thank you. Chris, um, this has been an extraordinary hour and a half, um, seeing the history of your formation as an artist, how Question Bridge came about and how it has morphed and changed and responded to new dynamics. Mm -hmm. And your responses to all of these proposals and thoughts coming from the audience has been absolutely stunning um, and precise and rigorous and very much appreciated. So everyone um, uh, who's with us, I hope you can join me in offering the hugest of thanks, the warmest of thanks to Chris Johnson for sharing his wisdom with us today. Thank you thank very you. much. As I said earlier, yeah, it's really an honor and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have a shout out from Erica Demon and others. <laughs> um, and there's um, a lot of really fabulous students on this call and a lot of really distinguished artists themselves all of whom are inspired by you. All right, um, thank you. Thank you everyone to be continued next Thursday. And when OMCA reopens, go and see Question Bridge for yourself again, if you've seen it already. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>